Good evening and welcome back everyone. Uh, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits and we are here for the very map heavy uh, Northeastern Italian tasting. So we have in front of us four very classic wines from this region but we also have five other really classic wines from this part of the world and I want to talk about those first but let's go to the map. Well, let's pour ourselves a glass of the Suave by Suavia here. And this is a Suave Classico. That's about to be important in just a moment. So do bear that little note in mind. But let's pour ourselves a little bit of white wine and then let's jump straight into maps. So this is Northeastern Italy. Here's the city of Venice. And for us, at least more importantly, here's the city of Verona. Here's the city of Bologna. Up here is Switzerland, Austria. And because this is a really old book, this is listed as Yugoslavia, uh, but this is actually you know, modern day Slovenia. So we are up in the northeastern corner of Italy, and this is a jam packed region. When we're talking about like Tuscany, it's like, okay, well, we have, you know, Chianti, and we have the Super Tuscans, and we have. Um, Montepulciano and we have uh, Montalcino, but broadly they're all Sangiovese except the Super Tuscans which are sometimes Sangiovese and sometimes like Cabernet or Merlot. With this it's a giant mixed bag. So the wines that we're going to taste in order, they're going to come from Suave which is this little tiny area just east of Verona. And Verona is an important city. We're going to keep coming back to Verona. Uh, just like we're going to keep coming back to Lake Garda uh, up here. You know, Lake Garda is not well marked on this map, but it is broadly in here. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the second one we're going to taste is going to come up from in here in Friuli Venezia Giulia, or we just call it Friuli. Uh, our third one will come down here. So around Verona, the most important thing about Verona is this is the Valpolicella country, as well as Bartolino just across the river here. Uh, this is all Corvina, along with Molinara and Rondinella. So this is where your Valpolicellas, your Bartolinos, uh, your Ripassos, and your Ambarones, which we'll talk about in a minute. That all comes from in here. And then finally, we are going to talk about the absolutely tiny but so, so, so cool uh, region of Terraldego, uh, which is on the map. But yeah, I had it a second ago. Should be right about here. Maps are difficult when you're reading them upside down. Give me just, oh, right here. There was right under my fing finger. It was right here, so right up here. But that's not all they make in here. There's a lot going on in this part of the world. So while we have our first glass of white wine, and we will talk about it in just a moment, I want to talk about some of the other things that we aren't talking about. The elephant in the room, of course, is our friend Prosecco. Prosecco is, you know, historically made from the Galera grape variety. But these days it's made from Glera, it's made from Chardonnay, it's made from Trebbiano, it can be made from Pinot Grigio. It has lost a little bit of its specific focus. This is a very nice, inexpensive Prosecco. This is by uh, Giusti, this is the Rosalia. They make some really, really neat wines. Now, in this book, which I really like because, you know, now if you got a modern wine book, it would say Prosecco is like all of this. This really lists in the book the two most important regions, uh, which are Prosecco di Conegliano and Valdobbia Deni, which are right these little tiny regions here, just kind of due north of Treviso. And Prosecco, being based in Glera, they are done in a steel tank method, which is a really unique method. So compared to like Champagne, where they make the wine and then they take it still into the bottle and they re-ferment in the bottle in like a cold underground cave, with Prosecco, they take the exact same process, but rather than doing it in individual bottles, they ferment the wine dry and still, and then they move it into a big steel tank, and then they re-ferment in there, and then once it's carbonated, they chill it right down to a degree or two above freezing, and then under pressure, they bottle it, so you don't have to do all the individual in-bottle re-fermentation, which is part of the reason why Prosecco is $17.95 and Champagne's 50 bucks. Now, there's also a lot of wines, if you've been paying attention, like Cavas and Cremants that are made exactly like Champagne, that are $25, and even a little less, but we're not going to discuss all of those complexities. If you're taking away from this that champagne is a lot of hype and bullshit, you're taking away the right lesson. So, oh, hello. You'd like the first one, I imagine. Absolutely. Hello, Han. Nice to have you back. So, let's talk about the wine in our glasses here. So this is coming from 
the Suave region. So here's the city of Verona. My finger's not funny. There we go. And then just to the east is, in this map, Suave Classico. Now, Suave Classico is really interesting because the term Classico, you see it on Italian wine labels a lot. And Classico, to a modern sense, kind of means pre-1960. Because in 1960, the Italian wine agencies and the wine, wine industry basically said, okay, well, we're doing really well with things like Chianti and Suave and Valpolicella, and they're starting to develop a really big international following. So what if we didn't just harvest grapes from the really good hillsides that they're famous from? What if we started taking grapes from kind of the... What's a nice word for shitty? Let's just go with shitty. The shitty, silty plains below those hills, and they just expanded those regions. So Suave, Valpolicello, Chianti, they kind of expanded out to these, these lesser regions to support the export market. And as a result, when you see, you know, Suave, and it doesn't say Classico, you know you're at least getting some wine from the plains. Now, I have perhaps been a little harsh there. Uh, if you remember back to our German Riesling tasting, one of the best things we had on the table was from the Rhine Hessian. And the Rhine Hessian is exactly that, is a glacial sculpted alluvial floodplain, very silty, very gravelly, lots of different soils. You can make great wine from floodplains. You absolutely can. But by comparison, the hillsides are more impressive. So this is the Suavia Suave. Now, um, this is made by a trio of sisters. This is made by Alessandra, Valentino, and Mary Tessari. Uh, and they make, I think, the best Suaves in all of Italy. Uh, let me explain why. All of their wines are 100% Suave Classico. Uh, they do make a, uh, a Trebbiano di Suave, which is actually basically Verdicchio. Um, but most of their wines are 100% Garganega or Garganega. Um, this is, okay, let's, let's back this up a little bit. The, the main grape variety behind Suave, uh, it has to be 70% of the blend, is Garganega. And I very, this is one of my absolute favorite wine grapes in the world. Uh, it's just after Riesling for me. And I've been saying it for my entire life as Garganega. And I'm very slowly trying to retrain myself to say Garganega. And I'm really working at it because I, I love the grape so much I do want to say it right. Like I wouldn't want to call Riesling Riesling or Riesling. Um, although in a couple parts of the world that's actually phonetically correct. But generally we call it Riesling. Um, but yes, it is actually Garganega. And it is the main grape variety behind Suave. 70% in classic or in the standard Suaves. I believe it's 90% for Classico. The rest tends to be um, Trebbiano di Suave. Uh, there is some Trebbiano di Toscana up here, although they are working on getting that out of there. It has either just come out as being illegal to put in the blend, or it's just about to become illegal. So uh, Trebbiano di Toscana is about to become no longer, or has just become no longer legal to put in here. But Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio have found their way into the blend as well. But let's talk about Garganega. God, that still sounds weird to me. As a grape. If you're getting some notes and saying, hey, that kind of smells like really good Sauve Blanc, you're not wrong. I get Sauve Blanc notes like grapefruit and lime and grass and a little bit of like green apple. And then over the top of that, I get such incredible like nuttiness, new mown hay, fresh green grass, pear. I love this grape so much. And what's really neat about uh, Suavia is they only work with white grapes. They only work in Suave. Uh, and they make a few different things. I went to the website today to do some research. Um, they make seven things, one of which is an olive oil. So they make six, or sorry, four wines that are based in Garganega. So they make this Suave. They make a higher end version of this called Monte Carbonara. Uh, they make a slightly late harvested, like off, slightly off dry version of this uh, called Le Rive. And they make a dessert wine from this uh, whose name is escaping me. We carry all four because I absolutely adore this woman's winemaking. Uh, they make, as I said, they make a uh, Trebbiano di Suave as well. And then they also make a sparkling wine. I don't think at this point those are sold in Alberta. So I'm literally selling everything from this winery I can get my hands on because they're so damn good. Um, like this is $20.95 on the shelf and it is by no means the least expensive thing that we are doing today. We are actually doing a $12 wine today. Why are we doing that? So that we could afford this big juicy bastard at the end. But we'll get to that when we get to that. But this is 
Garganega. This is the wine behind Suave. This is why Suave historically is one of the great white wines of Italy. I mean, one of the things about Suave, and again, this just goes back to me working in a wine store, I remember coming into work and, you know, we had Suave and we had Trebbiano and we had Frascati and we had Pinot Grigio and they are all really and truly much of a muchness. Um, Pure Pen in the mid-1990s started kind of clawing back some of the quality standards for Suave, at least on an international level. Uh, I'm sure these folks were doing it, but it, it hadn't hit here yet. The first Suave I ever had, and this would have been about 2008-ish, that actually showed some quality, that showed me what Gargany was capable of, um, that was Pure Pens. And whenever I see Pure Pen Suave just on a wine list in a restaurant, purely for nostalgia, my first like love affair with Garganega, um, that I have to order because it's right there and I absolutely love that one because it's how I discovered and fell in love with Suave. But Pirofen's actually more money than this and I don't think it's actually as good. This is absolutely brilliant. So almond into marzipan, fresh fruit, lovely lime, lots of grass, pretty everyday white wine that you could absolutely just glug down. But also if you really go looking for complexity here, you'll find quite a bit. And it's coming from this little tiny set of hills just outside Verona where everybody goes to drink Valpolicella, but just outside town, there's Suave. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, a lot of the interesting stuff that we've been seeing uh, for Garganega has not been Suave. Uh, Menti wines, uh, which if Devon's your wine guy, you have bought a lot of Menti over the last two years. Uh, they have an orange wine, uh, which we'll cover pretty extensively with Romato here, uh, as well as a sparkling Garganega. Uh, and they make absolutely spectacular wines, uh, but they make them outside the uh, the Suave DOC. I'll just quickly get some comments. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are drinking a Suave. Nice way to end the workday. Yeah, this one is so nice. I really like the Suave. Hmm. It's how it sits in the mouth, isn't it? Like it's, it's big and it's mouth filling and it's rich. And if you close your eyes and you don't think about the flavor, just think about how it fills your mouth. It doesn't hit your mouth like a Sauvignon Blanc, it doesn't hit your mouth like a Riesling does. And it doesn't hit like a Gruner. It's, it's big and it's rich and it's mouth filling. If you take everything else away and you just focus about how it feels. If you said to me, Kyle, this is a Pinot Blanc, or this is a Chardonnay because nothing else is that fat, nothing else is that opulent. I don't think you'd be wrong. And yet they're doing it in a much, much colder climate than either of those grapes really like. So I really like this grape. Um, Suave is starting to catch on. We're starting to see some higher end examples, but right now you can get cheap Suave for like nothing and very, very good Suave for like 20 bucks. Um, yes, you should always buy the Classico varieties because there's a lot of bad Suave out there. Um, I don't think we have anything really bad on our shelves right now, but Let's be fair, it's easy to sneak a bad Suave in there because who knows, you know? Sometimes even a bad region will make a great wine and then the next year it's just trash. So yeah, Suave, bit of an up and comer, but a very old, very historical region with a lot of history and a lot of quality behind it. Aaron, what's for you, sir? The Suave. The Suave. Yeah, thanks. So many positive comments. Gotta get in there. Well, you do. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So while we're talking about this region, we're going to talk about some of the lesser lights, the, the parts of this that we aren't tasting. And we're going to go to wine number two in that range. So this is Lambrusco. Uh, and on our map, you are further down here. This is the Lambrusco country down here. Now, this is a inexpensive, to say the least, Lambrusco. I think we're charging a princely sum of ten ninety five for this. Now, Lambrusco is very interesting. This is a sparkling red wine with a ton of history to it. These are traditionally dry, interesting, medium to higher alcohol, like we're talking 12, 13% alcohol red wines, kind of like those Austra dry Australian Shirazes that kind of took the market over for a little while in like the mid 2000s, like 2008, 2009. I can remember selling a lot of E&E &E sparkling Shiraz and Best sparkling Shiraz and Magella sparkling Shiraz. They kind of follow on with that. But they fell out of fashion, and they fell out of fashion hard. And as a result, they couldn't sell those really interesting, dry, sparkling red wines because absolutely no one, including myself at that point, knew how to sell them. So they did what they had to do, and they started sweetening them because 
This was wine that was actually very often served, at least in pubs, slightly sweetened. So you'd get a dry Lambrusco and you'd order it with a little bit of sweetener. Very often there'd be a liqueur. But they were always served in bars a little bit sweeter. So they started sweetening them artificially. So the inexpensive, like sweet sparkling varieties, if you come in and you ask me straight out, hey Kyle, I'd like a sweeter red wine. I would bet you I would sell you this before I'll sell you an Apothic Red or a Barefoot or any of that nonsense, because this actually has 300 years of history behind it. Yes, they've only been re really sweetening it the last 40, 50 years, but they still do know what they're doing, and I like Lambrusco. So this is, again, a bit of an up-and-comer. Yes, a lot of their history, at least for modern history, has been selling kind of $10 sweet sparkling reds like this, but there are some of the drier ones coming in. We carry a couple of them. The dry Lambruscos are real up-and-comers and they do some really interesting stuff. So, not something I put into the tasting lineup today because it's a really minor region, but I did want to talk about it. Now, let's talk for real about our next wine. So this, this is our Pinot Grigio Ramazzo. Now, you're probably saying, if you've been in here a bit the last year, you say, God, that doesn't look like the Pinot Grigio Ramato that you've been selling us for the last year, and you're right. That one's sitting on a dock in Montreal till late October, and that is, of course, the Corte Giacobbe Pinot Grigio Ramato that's been, no, not even pretty much. It has just straight up been our best-selling rosé for the last year and change, because it kicks ass. This is, to me, well, let's be very honest. This is the wine that we bought sight unseen because it was a Ramato Pinot Grigio when we needed a replacement. However... Devin and I tasted this this afternoon, and we split on it. Devin still likes the Corte Giacobbe better. I actually like this a little more. So what is this, and why is it important? So starting up here, and all the way across, all through Friuli, Giulia, Trentino, uh, even into the Alto Adige, this is Pinot Grigio country. They grow Pinot Grigio in Italy, everywhere from the Austrian-Swiss border all the way down to Sicily. They grow Pinot Grigio goddamn everywhere. But where do they grow it well? They grow it way up here where it's cold and stony and mountainous. And that's this part of Italy, the Alto Adige, Friuli, and Trentino. This is Pinot Grigio country for the high quality stuff in Italy. And this one comes from Friuli, so you're over here. Now, this part of the world, Pinot Grigio, unlike Chardonnay, to a certain point, unlike Pinot Blanc, you want it with a little more acidity. You want that brightness, you want that freshness, you want that almost like grapefruit citrus character because this is a patio crusher. Chardonnay can sit on the vine all day because you're just going to throw it in a big oak barrel and, you know, I'm not even going to lie, I like that style. I like those big buttery fat Californian Chardonnays. I will love those till my dying day. But you can't make those in a cold climate. You can't make really great Pinot Grigio in a hot climate because Pinot Grigio doesn't respond the right way. Now, why is this pink? Well, that's an interesting story. So when we talk about Pinot, it's actually all the same species of vine. It's just Pinot. Pinot Noir and Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris, those are really great descriptors of differences when they're in the same species, but it's all just Pinot. Pinot Blanc is the white grapes, Pinot Noir is the black or red grapes, uh, and Pinot Gris are the gray or pink grapes. So this wine, after it's harvested, spends 10 hours sitting with its skins Picking up that lovely pinkish coppery color, uh, in Italian romato means copper, uh, it picks up that little bit of color. So is this a rosé? Not by any of the traditional rosé making methods that we talk about, like saignet or tenturiers or the, the classical French method of taking your red grape with very dark red skins and just soaking it for a couple of hours. It's not any of those. Strictly speaking, this Ramato is an orange wine. It's perhaps the sneakiest, most subtle orange wine of all because it just comes off as a kind of 1995, not desperately serious seeming rosé. And that's its charm. No, Sorry, Siri, I, I don't need you. you. Shut up, Siri. On to the second here. So what do we have in our glasses? Well, it's it's less pink than a lot of rosés. It's very much more in that kind of coppery salmon color. That might also be the hot lights, but you know, even against white paper, I don't pick up like any pinky purple notes. This is fully into salmon, into beige. Like this is not a very pink purple wine. 
because it never sees pinky, purple, dark red grape skins. It's seeing these dusky orange pinky skins and that's all it ever sees. It doesn't have an opportunity to pick up those bluey pinky notes because it's not really exposed to them. Hmm. So this is the style of wines that we sold all of last summer, would have sold even more this summer, but understandably Italy is one of the very first countries to get absolutely hammered by COVID doesn't have the world's greatest export program right now. So we kind of are stuck with what they'll ship us, when they'll ship us. So the uh, the Corte Jacobi, which is our best seller, is currently sitting on a dock in quarantine in Montreal because it's coming from Italy, which was very hard hit. Um, this, however, I will say is a more than worthy replacement. I get grapefruit, I get apple, I get lime, I get a little bit of lemon. I get mineral, I get stone, I get a little bit of wet wool, almost kind of shenany as this warms up. Um, I'm drinking mine probably quite a bit cold, uh, warmer than yours. Uh, we, Devin and I took these out at about 10 past four uh, to taste them together because if I can, if, if we're not super busy, I like to taste all the wines in advance with Devin because he's got as good if not better a palate than I do and I love discussing the wines in advance with him because it's just so damn useful. Um, but yeah, this is a very pretty classic Pinot Grigio in this Previously, like even five years ago, I didn't know this style. Now it's like one of our best sellers. I love that this has become a thing and I absolutely adore that. Hmm. It's not as complex as the Suave. It's not, it has some things to like about it. It's very pretty, it's got a lot going on. It's bigger than the Suave, but let's be fair. This is something you could pair with a meal. This is something you could build a meal around. This is something you could sit down with, and I'm not kidding. You could sit there with this over five or six hours, letting the bottle slowly oxidize and aerate while you took notes, and you could learn five or six different things from this. This one's like, no, don't do that with me. Just take me outside in an ice chiller and drink me with five of your friends in 20 minutes, and you're all gonna get a nice little bit of a buzz, and that's exactly what I'm for but there's a lot of history with the Ramado style, with Friuli choosing to grow Pinot Grigio, because Friuli is really interesting. This little corner of Italy, I mean, think about it in terms of who's owned it. I mean, the kingdom of Italy as a whole is fairly new. I mean, there was the Republic of Venice that owned this. The Habsburgs have owned this. The Byzantine Empire has owned this. It has, you know, Swiss influences and Italian influ or, and German influences and uh, Austrian influences and Yugoslavian influences and influences coming in by sea through Venice from the Balkans. It has all these different things. So this part of the world, yes, we're growing Pinot Grigio here, but we're growing Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, uh, all coming in kind of either being endemic or with a little bit of kind of Franco-German or Franco-Swiss influence. And then coming out of the Balkans, there's Welsh Riesling. Um, there's some Gruner Veltliner in here. You've got quite a bit of well Frankish grown in here. And then coming in from Austria, you've got things like um, Riesling coming in. You've got uh, Sauvignon Blanc coming in from the Colio Hills. You've got so many different things that are grown here. There's actually a shocking amount of Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc grown in here because of how many different people have owned this part of the world over the centuries. It's got so many different, uh, different influences and different intrigues that have been put on it that it's just a bit of a patchwork quilt. Not to mention that again, in the 1980s, this was seen as a region that could put out high volumes of wine that could really produce a lot of wine for not a lot of money. Um, Mezzo, um, Mezzo Corona, pardon me, was the brand that really got big here. Like if you came into this store in 1989 and you wanted Pinot Grigio from Italy, I would bet you 500 1989 dollars that what you would have left to the store with was a Mezzo Corona Pinot Grigio because it was the only region, the only company that was exporting from here. Mezzo Corona I don't even think exists anymore, but they, they were the, the company that did this. It was a very, very interesting, very heavily overlapped by history uh, part of the world. So we have a lot of different things grown here and it's getting more interesting even over time. So I really like this part of the world because you're never sure from here if you're gonna get a Sauvignon Blanc, if you're gonna get a Friulani, you're gonna get a Toque, if you're gonna get anything, it's amazing. I love how intriguing this part of the world is. Okay, let's move on to, I think this hits literally a new low, not in quality, 
not in style. Um, this hits a new price point low. That on our shelves, full retail, all day long, is $12.25. Why? Well, we'll get into why in a minute. But I absolutely adore this wine. And Devin's first comment, I'm not trying to build Devin up as the bad guy here, but Devin's first comment was like, we need to raise the price on this. Like, no, because we still need great $12 wines. But he's right. This wine so grossly over delivers for what you pay for it. This could easily be a $16.95 wine. It just happens to be 12 and a quarter. It absolutely kills for the money. Aaron, is it funnier if I build up Devin as the vil villain? It is, isn't it? Yeah, let's just build up Devin as the villain. Yeah, it's good. Devin's basically Radigan. Uh, he's the world's greatest criminal mind. Okay, so let's get into Corvina and what Corvina is and why it's important. So we're going to jump back to the maps. I really hope Craig is watching because he's our king of the map club. So here's the city of Verona. Here's Suave itself. All up in here, and including Bartolino actually. Let's just, let's just lump Bartolino in because in terms of the grapes they use, it's the same. What differentiates Valpolicello and Bartolino is how they make the wines, and I'll cover that in a minute. But this is all Valpolicello up in here. Classico, Superiore. This is historically the heart of, if you want to think of it this way, Italian Beaujolais. They're light wines with a lot of acidity grown in a cold climate. They have a really nice tart cherry character. But in the 1960s, just like with Suave, the Italian government said, you know what? Let's not make really cool light wines. Let's just make a shitload of wine that's light and boring and let's export every last bit of it and pump it all over the market and just, let's just whore it out. And that was a conscious decision that they made and we're really only recovering from it now. So the Valpolicella blend, classically in the modern sense, post 1965, uh, is Corvina, which we'll get to when we pour the wine, along with Molinara and Rondinella. And whenever you read a wine textbook, you say, oh, well, you know, our, the recipe for Valpolicella going back hundreds of years is Corvina, Mond Molinara, and Rondinella, three light grape varieties that really need each other. And that's lovely. And you will probably pass your W set test if you give that answer. It also happens to be a complete fabrication. Corvina is the best of the grapes. It's also the hardest to grow of the three grapes. It's the one with the most character, the most interest, but Molinara and Rondinella will grow where Corvina won't. And they, historically, yes, were part of the blend, but they were like two, 3% at most. It was a Corvina-based wine with a little bit of Molinara and Rondinella in there. Usually it was at, at acidity and color. They were not high percentage varieties. When they said in 1965, they were all equally good. They were all part of our heritage blend. They ruined Valpolicella. They also massively increased the cropping in terms of like uh, tons per hectare. They introduced uh, mechanical harvesting. They just, they ruined the region. And so when you think Valpolicella, you're probably like, yes, please, please serve me something else that's not a Valpolicella, because that's what I think, and rightly so. So let's talk about this $12 Corvina that's not a Valpolicella. We will talk about the Valpolicella wines in a minute, because I actually do have a Ripasso and an Amarone, and I do want to talk about those for a minute. But yeah, this is Corvina, the best and most important, and probably should be only of the Valpolicella grapes. Now, this has been open for a while. I won't smell mine immediately. When I freshly cracked this, I got coffee, I got chicory, I got cherries. Remembering this is a $12 bottle of wine, I got my bloody like hair blown back. I was blown with how much I got out of this. And I'm still kind of am. I still get the chicory and I get the wood and I get like a really cool like savory beef jerky dried meat deer sausage thing. This is still $12. This is really good. And you're always going to get, uh, thank you, by the way, Brenda, the honest dialogue. Um, 
I'm always going to be honest. I'm going to be who I am. I'm one guy with one wine store. I don't have any real corporate interests or any other nonsense. I just want to tell you the truth about wine the way I see it. And if I upset some people, well, there were probably people I didn't want to buy from anyway. So, no. I'm always going to do my best to tell you the truth. It has happened on this channel that I've had a wine that I hated, and I straight out said I hated it. So, no. This is pretty. This is $12 wine that doesn't drink like $12 wine. I get cherries, I get leather, I get spice, I get chicory, I get coffee, I get a little bit of chocolate. I have some really neat mineral earthy notes, and actually it was Devin that pointed these out to me, like underneath all the coffee and chicory and everything else, like I get some really neat like fresh soil and almost like, like old hay characters that I really like. And these are not things you think of when you think $12 wine. You think $12 wine, you think like Lindemann's Bin 50 Shiraz that I could drink a bottle of and forget I had wine. Um, this is interesting and I really respect it. Now this is not labeled as Valpolicella because this comes from the region outside Valpolicella. But what was I talking about earlier with Valpolicella and Valpolicella Classico? There are some really lovely hillsides that lie outside the classical Valpolicella region, which is where this wine is sourced from. So you've got Valpolicella Classico, which is the old fashioned hillsides. You've got Valpolicella, which is kind of the, 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 the plains outside. But you know, when you come out of a river valley, it's not just plains to the end of the continent. You know, there are eventually hills again. And these come from the next hills over. So they're from Verona. They're just the next hills just slightly outside of Valpolicella. And they're making 100% Corvina, the best of Valpolicella grapes. They're making it incredibly well, but they're not calling it Valpolicella. They're not charging Valpolicella prices. They're just making great wine for 12 bucks. And I really respect that. So very simple wine, but I had a lot surprisingly to say about this one. So let's talk a little more about Valpolicella and why it's important and why we do have to spend a little bit more time on it. It smells like walking into a tack room. Now I have been to a tack room, not since I was divorced. My, uh, my ex-wife was a horse person. I'll be honest, it was only a tack room one time and I couldn't really say. So. Anyone else who's been to a tack room, perhaps more recently than 20 years ago, do fill me in. But uh, let's go with talking about Valpolicella Ripasso and Amarone. So Amarone is not one of those wines that has a deep and powerful historical basis. So we're still here. We're still kind of northeast of Verona here. We're up in the, the Veneto Hills. But what makes the difference between a $50 Amarone and a 1695 Valpolicella. Well, it's the drying. So Amarone literally means big bitter, and it was actually a mistake in winemaking. So before Amarone, you would have the Valpolicellas, which were light, fresh, high acid, pretty, very Beaujolais-esque wines. And then they would take those and they would dry them all the way to sweetness, and they would make a dessert wine called a Recioto. But on a couple of rare occasions, the Vecchiotto would not stop fermenting as a sweet wine. It would ferment all the way out, like 14 and a half, 15, even like, yeah, this one's 16.5. It would ferment to a absolutely fiery alcohol percentage, you know, for wine, uh, and it would end up very dry. And they were thought to be a fault. But then people started drinking them and they started tasting them. They said, you know, people might buy this. So Amarone is not something that goes back to the 1600s where some Cistercian monk invented it. No, this was invented in the bloody 1960s and it saved the region for premium wines. Not because of Amarone's, yes, that's hugely important, but because of Repasso's. So Amarone's became kind of, from about 1989 forward, 1994, they became the default expensive wine on Italian restaurant wine lists. And that was a very good place for it. It's delicious, it's immediately local. If you haven't had an Amarone, the thing I really like about them is they immediately taste expensive. And I really don't know how to qualify that other than the fact that alcohol has a really neat trick in the mouth. Up until the point where you perceive the alcohol as stringent or mentholate or, or, or too hot, it tastes luxurious and fat and rich and smooth. And as long as the Amarone had enough fruit and enough character and enough body and enough glycerin to carry off that alcohol, 
the emperor still had clothes. It could carry that off and it could create this, this illusion of being this incredibly, not even illusion, this incredibly voluptuous, rich, expensive tasting wine for realistically at that point, especially not a lot of money. Like uh, I was actually talking with my dad a couple of days ago, like he can remember having Amarone's on the shelf like 1495 because they weren't a thing yet. Um, but eventually they got big, they caught on, they, w they, they went off and people really liked them. They became kind of the default expensive Italian wine. Like before we got to Super Tuscans and things like Sassicaia and Salai and Ornolai and Tignanello, what was the default expensive wine? I mean, Brunello's really geeky. Barolo and Barbaresco are great, but they need like a decade of age before you can even look at them. Some of them need like 40 years, like the, uh, the Oderos we have over there. If you touch those before they're 30 years old, you're wasting your time. Those are my retirement wines. Uh, those are leaving on the day I retire because uh, I'm never going to sell them because I have no idea who I'd sell them to. Um, but really, you think about what else is out there, like high-end Chianti, Brunello, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Like, what else is a high-end wine from Italy? Especially one that drinks young. They're not really out there. So this became kind of the default expensive wine, and it was so lush and so rich, and this was during the California wine boom, when people were really into like fruity, interesting, complex, rich wines that had a high degree of alcohol, Amarone just fit right in. But it wasn't Amarone that really saved them. Amarone was great, but Amarone was rapidly increasing in price. What saved them was Ripasso, because Ripasso literally means to repass juice over. So let's say you take your harvested Valpolicelli grapes and you dry off 30 to 60 percent of the water to make your amarone and you're left with raisins and then you make wine from that but you can't crush the raisins too hard if you crush them too hard you risk crushing the seeds now the seeds in wine grapes are not like the seeds in table grapes table grapes are you know the size of your thumb well your thumb without a giant stupid blue splint on it um but the size of your thumb they're big, they're water fat, they're relatively thin skins, they have very tiny seeds, if they have seeds at all. Wine grapes aren't like that. Wine grapes are the size of like your pinky fingernail and they have a huge seed in the middle and they're very thick skins. So when you dry them, they become even smaller. So you get very little liquid off of them. So once you've made your Amarone, what are you gonna do with all those skins that are still full of incredibly expensive, incredibly concentrated, flavorful juice? Well, they got the really brilliant idea of taking the less expensive wine and just mixing it in with the high, high, high cost Amarone grapes. Because just through mixing, just through osmosis or just how, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. Craig could answer this, but Craig's probably bloody busy. Bloody Craig, eh? Um, basically, you mix a super concentrated Amarone juice that's very expensive with a cheap $12 juice and you up with something kind of in the middle. Now, you can mix them 50-50, this could be 90-10, 99%, 1%. There's no real restrictions on Ripasso, uh, other than Superiori does actually have some restrictions on it. But there's no limit to what that limit is. But you can see Ripasso's at less money than Valpotel's. There's Ripasso's out there at $14.95 retail. There's Ripasso's out there at $34.95. But it's how much Amarone juice and how much care and attention is going into the Ripasso versus the $12 stuff. So really interesting family of wines. And if you've never really explored Valpolicello versus Ripasso versus Amarone, or even the dessert wine style, the, the Recciotos, um, really interesting winemaking philosophy that really only came out like post-1960 and really redeemed this region as a quality wine producing region. Because let's be fair, it, it got really bad there for a while. I mean, for my dad, he'd just as soon buy a Valpolicella as buy like, I don't know, rat poison. Like to, to certain people of a certain age, like Valpolicella was death because the wines were so bad. I imagine I have a lot of angry comments or maybe some good comments. Let's find out. Uh, Brenda, I see your comment. I will, uh, I will post some pictures at the end. Actually, Aaron, could you give us like a really like close-up sweep of the wine label so Brenda can get a good example of all of them? Sure. Thank you. Uh, what grace did I say in Valpolicella? They are Corvina, uh, and Rondinella is actually a descendant of Corvina, but they are Corvina, Molinar, and Rondinella. There may be a day next year 
10 years from now, 30 years from now, when Molinara or Rondinella might have a redemption. Maybe they adapt better to climate change. Maybe they become more interesting because somebody discovers what to do with them. But right now, where we're standing in September 2020, Corvina is the quality grape. Molinar and Rondinella are just kind of there. That said, 15 years ago, if we'd been having this conversation about Cava, we'd have said that Maccabeu was the interesting grape and Parietta and Shirello were just kind of there. Time has now proven that that is absolutely not the case and that Shirello and Parietta are incredibly interesting, incredibly great complex grapes on their own and that they deserve full respect. So right now, this is the grape to get out of Alpoacella. But that's true today. In five years, I might be standing right here to you in front of the same camera in front of Aaron saying, you know what's great? Molinara. Because wine's changeable. We don't know. Also, god damn, 12 bucks, eh? All right, I'll take that. Okay. Uh, can you ask her if that's enough? Did she get it? I think she got it. I think we all got it. I, think that I actually, I'm not caught up enough on the video to know if we got it yet. But yes, um, Brenda, let us know if that was a good enough high res shoot of the labels for you. Okay, so we have talked about most of the regions, including some very major regions. Hang tight. Hang tight. It's maps o'clock, but Aaron's getting wine. You know what? That's what you. That's what brought you here. If you're here by accident, I'm so sorry. But for those of you who've been watching for a while, you knew what you were getting yourself in for. Um, so Teroldego, uh, it's not the most important region here, but gotta like this variety. Gotta like this region. So the region and the grape variety, the same word, Teroldego. So it's. I mean, if you really want to say it was Teroldego di Teroldego, um, they call it Vigneti della. Dolomiti uh, because Teroldego isn't yet its own DOC. It's in application for its own DOC. A lot of people treat Teroldego as being, in fact, no, Teroldego is a DOC. This Teroldego comes from outside the region because it's uh, Vigneti della Dolomiti IGT. So, but however, this is the winemaker that we need to talk about when we talk about Teroldego. So this wine manual came out in 1981. And in the big long, you know, page long description, Terrigo gets like three lines at most. I didn't point at the lines where it is, but it's, it's like three lines at most. And I was like, yes, it's an interesting local grape that will never really come of anything. In 1985, Elisabetta Fordori started making Terraldego in Italy. And she started making it to a level that no one else in Italy had ever even approached. She started making wine that was not just great for the region, which Teroldego was nothing. Like her second year, probably, she was making the best wine in the region. So it wasn't just making wine for Northeastern Italy or just Italy. She wanted to make wine that was absolutely notable on a global scale. And now, 30 years later, this is the 2016 Fordori. There is every other Teroldego on this level. And then there is Elisabetta's Teroldego, or as as Elisabetta Fordori's Teroldego, way up here. She makes the best Teroldego in the world, and it's not really close. We carry two. We carry this one at about 32. We actually have a $50 version of this that, honestly, we sell a frankly shocking amount of, um, considering it's a region that most people haven't heard of. But like, when people come, it's like, yeah, we're going to barbecue. We want something fun and Italian, but we just want to spend about 50 bucks like this. Just, just take it. It's great. This is the wine that these are less expensive so I could show you this. Everything else we have done to this point, this is, this is all a preamble to this one because I love this wine so much. Aaron, would you do me a solid and dump my, the rest of my Corvina in the sink? Thank you. So let's get to the big show. Now, when I first opened this, I did note that this was quite reductive. I got some kind of funky barnyard characters, like a little bit of uh, volatile acidity or VA. 
Now this one has been open for about two hours for me. Maybe you're just opening yours right now. But my God, this is pretty. Like it's dark. It's a big extracted, um, macerated wine. It has tons of power. It has good alcohol. It has great acidity. It's punchy. This is to me what this part of the world is really capable of because it's not immediately accessible. I'm not just throwing fruit and oak and fun at you. It's not, it's not a desperately fun wine. It's a very serious wine. And uh, full points to any of you who have uh, made yourself like a charcuterie plate at home or even just having like craft mac and cheese out of the pot at home while you do this. Because anyone who's having a little bit of salt, anyone who's having a little bit of fat, anyone who's having anything that will just create a little bit of salty, fatty stuff on their palate, they're experiencing this wine on a level that I can't because I don't have that to hand. Just gone and bought some bloody beef jerky from the gas station, but didn't do that. So this is a wine that will reward time. It will reward thought. It will reward having it with food. But I'm not doing any of those things. I'm just having it on its own. So let's talk about it on its own. God, I like that so much. It's so pretty. It's blueberries and then it's blackberries and then it's straight to rhubarb. Like normally it's strawberry rhubarb. Now it's just like F strawberries. We don't need strawberries in this house. It's just blueberry, blackberry, and then straight into rhubarb. Then I get limestone. Then I get like crumbly granite. And then I go straight into like smoke. And I absolutely love that. And it just sticks around and sticks around and sticks around. And it turns back into limestone the longer it waits. The nose is bright and it's lifted and it's got tons of just like sparkling notes. Because the wine has a ton of acidity, those, wine, those notes seem a little tart. But again, once you have food and those fats start soaking up those acids, because fats are acid sponges, it just starts turning that corner. It starts turning from being like, a lightly acidic wine has a lot of potential to a wine that just it just meets everything you're you're pairing it with and it's like hi i'm your best friend this red wine we're just going to go on this amazing like trip to your stomach together and i love that about this because high acid red wines have that character jeremy i've never hated you more than i do right now because you're having this with lamb and i want lamb right now because goddamn, i like that Okay, so this will be our last uh, trip to the maps for now. Uh, until I decide it's not our last trip to the maps, in which case we'll go back to the maps. But this is the last region that we will talk about as a sub-region. We're going way the bloody hell over here to Trieste, the formerly free city of Trieste. Um, we're here. So it still is says Yugoslavia, because old book, but this is Slovenia, and these are the Kolio Hills. The Kolio Hills are, well, we call them more like foothills. They are sharp, they are steep, they are, those are the foothills of uh, like the Slovenian and Swiss Alps or Austrian Alps. They are really, really tall, they're really granity, and they're mostly actually in Slovenia. There's only about a third of the regions actually in Italy. But that's what we call the Colio Hills. Now they have their own local variant of Sauvignon Blanc, which they call Friolano, which I actually really like. It's tough to find good examples of it because they don't make well they make lots but they make virtually nothing for export because in their view it's like we could call it Sauvignon Blanc and they make a lot of Sauvignon Blanc there and everybody will buy it or we could call it Friolano and like five wine nerds and their moms will buy it and you know fair enough I get it um but the Friolano and the Sauvignon Blanc from this little tiny corner of Italy is so damned awesome I absolutely love it and we have one I didn't want to do this, A, because I only have like six of these to sell, seven of these to sell, but B, because it's just, it's so damn obscure. But if you love Sauvignon Blanc, like to your soul, if you're like, seeing it, it's like, you know what? We had some cool wines today with some Suave and some Pink Grigio and some Terral Dago, but you know what I really wanted? I wanted me some Cloudy Bay or Dog Point or even Oyster Bay Sauv Blanc. Go explore the Colio stuff, because damn, that's good Sauv Blanc for not a lot of money traditionally. That's a really underappreciated South Blanc region. And that's, that's northeastern Italy. All of the bits that are important right now. Now, why are we using this old map? Well, for one, 
Uh, it, when I got up this morning, the first thing I said was, Kyle, don't forget your modern full color map of northeastern Italy. Bring your book to work. I got on the treadmill and I said, Kyle, don't forget your book. Then I was in the shower. I said, Kyle, don't forget that book. Then I was in the car driving to work and I said, fuck me, I forgot my book. Uh, and uh, that was that was how today went. But I'm kind of glad I don't have my much better, full color, much nicer looking map. Because this one has a lot of regions that I've never heard of before. Um, like we have Cabernet di Pramagiori coming from like basically like the suburbs of Venice at this point. I've never heard of that. Maybe we've heard of that in five years. Maybe some of these regions that in 1981 when this book came out, maybe they were a big deal then, but wouldn't make the modern cut. Because let's be fair, what have we talked about today? Like eight, nine regions that all make incredible wines? This is a this is a cradle of winemaking and good ideas and interesting ideas. They they invented Amarone. They they have like Garganega. Uh, pardon, they have uh, the the Romano Pinot Grigios. They have sweet and dried Lambruscos. They have Prosecco. They have so many neat ideas. What's this part of Italy going to come up with next? That's good. I don't know yet, and I love not knowing because is Cabernet di Parmigiore going to be the next great thing or is it extinct? I don't know but I can't wait to find out and that's why I wanted to do this region specifically is because it's just an absolute hotbed for fascinating winemaking it has been for like 500 years it's it's an absolute brilliant region and that's thank you for letting me just be a massive massive nerd tonight and uh I really appreciate you all for just letting me geek out for like an hour. Um, so that is our ludicrously geeky 1981 map focus tasting for tonight. Thank you all so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. Um, as we get into, I will make one little announcement. As we get into Scotch season, obviously we can't do our fall whiskey series, which would have been entering its year 26th or something year at this point. We can't do that. So we are going to be doing bi-weekly wine tastings interspersed with bi-weekly whiskey chats where we're not going to be the DLC were very very clear that we couldn't sell like hand bottled little bottles to give out to customers we can't do that so we're going to be doing whiskey chats we're going to be doing heavily discounted bottles of whiskey if you want to buy one and then we're going to be having chats with whiskey makers whiskey importers people all over the industry and that's going to be six over the course of fall and that's going to be our big program coming in. So that's still in the very early stages. Well, early stages. I have five out of six already booked. But early-ish stages. Uh, but that's coming up. <laughs> hey, you haven't heard about it yet because you don't need to hear about it yet. Uh, but yeah. Show up. You just show up and film this. shit. No, it's fine. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. This was an absolute delight talking about this because this is a part of the world that I hope my passion for it came through. I really care about this part of the world, and I really was, I absolutely love sharing it with you. Uh, after the German tasting, this is about the most me thing I've done so far, and I really hope you weren't entirely bored about me just geeking about my favorite part of the world for 60 minutes. If you weren't, I'm Kyle Baines with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits. And if you were terribly bored, eh, tell them I work for Wine Cavern or something. All right, we're gonna call that good. <laughs> Good night, everyone.